Okay, welcome to the meeting. We are going to get started now with our attendance. Okay. Mike? Here. Dan? Here. Thank you. Bree? Here. Naomi? Okay, we'll circle back. Stephanie? Oh, she's absent, yes. Alan, absent. Chad? Here. Gabe? Here. James? Here. Alex? Here. Taylor here? Paul? Here. Okay, is Naomi here? Okay, absent. Wonderful. On to the approval of the agenda. Is there anything anyone wants to add to our agenda today? Yes. I would like to um, just simply add that the AHEC info request will um, also have an info request for uh, black student enrollment, uh, retention and support uh, advocacy being done by the administration. And so it will kind of be a two parter. I don't expect us to vote on these per what you said last uh, last week or two weeks ago, Taylor, I think it'd just be the idea is that um, when y'all know we're submitting these requests. So. Uh, quick point of clarification. Are you asking AHEC that or MSU Denver that? Because those are two different entities. Appreciate the point of clarification. AHEC for the parking one, uh, MSU Denver for the uh, enrollment one. And this is a, resolu a new resolution for this week? No resolutions. These are information requests that I just wanted to share with the council. That okay. We're submitting in the hopes of having more information on these areas of advocacy. So that would be a um, new business item F. Oh, he's going to lump it in it. Honestly, I just wanted to lump it into A, um, and I was going to send both documents into the chat. I, I didn't even necessarily think that um, I wasn't going to suggest an open discussion or, or, or vote on it necessarily along the lines of what you'd said about these kind of requests last week. Cool. Um, is there anything else anyone wants to add to the agenda? Okay, amazing. Um, on to our chair updates with Chad. All right, uh, only chair update I have is that last night, Mike and I attended the uh, mayoral debate surrounding food insecurities and um, um, agriculture in Denver. Uh, I do wanna encourage everybody that anytime that we do have events that we have agreed to sponsor, that we have max attendance. Um, yeah. Thank you, Chad. My only update is that on next week's agenda, we have our vote to remove Alan, Alan Williams. Okay. On to SACAB, Mike. So SACAB had a fun day today. So um, first thing, first and foremost, um, I had mentioned there's an event going to be happening. Um, we It was going to be happening actually two weeks ago, but we pushed that back. That is going to be March 29th as a Wednesday, that will be from um, 11 to 2. Um, during that event, um, say it's going to be sponsored by SACAB, so we are going to provide money to you guys. Um, we're going to be providing most of the food. We're going to do, like, whether it's a pizza style, like, we're going to do, like, half of this money is going to be gone to pizza. The half is going to go to, like, a trail mix station, because I think that's very popular at FIFA Finals. Um, in addition, we are going to be giving the institutions money to give away or like money to get prizes and stuff in the bookstore. We're also be going to get some uh, bookstore gift cards. Um, we can get two to each institution for two twenty five. Um, that's going to be for giveaways as well. So um, the goal is um, to pass this budget next week and get that to the events chair, which is Chad. Um, when we do get that, um, the goal is we need to have like at least two different carnival style events at that um, event. So I'll have more information next week. All right, we'll go to Gabe for Board of Trustees update. Here we go. Hi, hello. If y'all weren't awake, y'all awake now. Okay, so the Board of Trustees, I have no new updates so far. You know, it's, it's still just quiet for now. Um, our meetings are coming up soon. I believe it's the 16th and the 17th. Um, and so if y'all like any information y'all want me to relay, just let me know, please. Just like Teams A or email A or something. Um, so then I can just let them know. Cool. Thank you. 
Thanks, Gabe. On to budget committee with Mike. So <clears throat> budget committee did not meet this week. Um, I don't have any kind of new information. Um, if you need anything budget related, like information, just let me know and I will send it over. All right, we'll go to Taylor, then Alex for sustainability committee. Okay, um, so I want to update that we have gotten zero requests this semester for funding for green purchases. So if you know a student org who may be interested, let me or Alex know. On to you, Alex. I have no new updates. Thank you. On to the Judiciary Committee with James. OK, so the Judiciary Committee did me and uh, we kind of agreed on some things. So I have a quick statement to make. Which I'm going to read to you right now, so let's have fun. So currently I'm working with MSU Denver's administration to ensure that the restorative process we're utilizing is in alignment with the law and our institutional values. Given, given some capacity and availability, I'm delaying the vote to remove Alan Williams by one week, March 10th, to make sure we are having the conversations necessary to accomplish this process in an equitable and legal manner. And that is it from the judiciary. Okay, thank you, James. On to the TSEC Public Relations Committee with Chad. Uh, TSEC Public Relations Committee did not meet because it was a snow day on Thursday, um, but we're working uh, super closely with elections. Uh, we have a new elections page on our MSU SGTSAC.com. Um, so if you know anybody that is interested in running, including members here, please look at that for a resource uh, for timelines and uh, any information on that. Thanks, Chad. On to the SAB with Taylor and James. James, you can go first. Uh, SAB as a council has officially concluded its work as far as deliberation and agreeing on three proposals. So from here on out, we are moving forward with making sure those proposals are finalized and then Taylor and I will present them to the Board of Trustees. Anything else, Taylor? Yeah, this is like from my perspective. Um, Basically, it's pretty unlikely that anyone's going to get an increase. Most people are going to get a little bit of a decrease. Um, but some are getting a larger percent of a decrease than others. Thank you. On to the Policy Advisory Committee with Ree. Hi. OK, well, I have a little bit of news. Um, Megan Jones, of course, is our policy administrator for the university in the president's office. And I, I talked with her. Mike had had this idea, actually to find out if we could take unused scholarship funds to be able to divert them and use um, for various needs for students. And she has spoken with Shelly Thompson, who's the Associate Vice President of University Advancement. And we're gonna have a meeting um, next week, it looks like, hopefully, to see if we can divert some of the funds and create a new policy for this so it's not just haphazard. Um, when a donor is not involved in the funds, and it may be not a donor-derived um, scholarship that is unused, that we could use for a variety of things. So coming up with this policy, we're going to really have to talk about this, and I welcome anybody to, you know, put heads together where we talk about, well, you know, maybe it's it, things are used for student mental well-being, um, for department needs, specifically going through the faculty senate, uh, maybe CMEI has some initiatives that they can't fund currently, and there'd have to be, of course, return on investment for this to assure them that funds are being used appropriately. And, and sorry, and um, are successful in 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 this idea. So I would love to be able to talk to Mike and I would any of you with ideas. And we'll take this forward with um, Shelly and Megan. Thanks. Thank you for that, Ree. And we're going to go right back to you for Faculty Student Affairs Committee. I met with Barbara last week and shared our presentation that we hope to um, that Chad and Taylor will present to the Faculty Senate on March 1st. Um, and she suggested a few things that we need to tweak. And I'll be talking to Chad um, and whomever else would like to put that, has put that presentation together so we can have it more related to our goals in our ask. Awesome, thank you. 
Uh, we'll go to the Indigenous Student Resource Committee, Dan. Yeah, so we met this week. Um, several of us did to go over some various goals that we have and some resolutions that we're working on, um, creating a survey. So it was a good meeting. Um, Paul, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add, thank you, Dan, um, that uh, one of the things that the committee is doing is we're also looking at giveaway stuff. And I don't want us to pause and think, wait, we're already doing a giveaway because um, more than one giveaway would probably be a really good way to increase engagement. And we really have a problem with engagement. And so I want to encourage that we take up all these opportunities to increase engagement, including the ones being brought forward by the Indigenous Student Resource Committee. We have some really cool surveys that really get, you know, um, open ended questions. We have one version, um, one general survey, and then one for um, uh, BIPOC students to take. And so we can get some honed in results on that population. Um, and yeah, talked about some different um, some some different kind of incentives. But uh, yeah, Dan pretty much covered it. Thank you. Thank you both. On to the open floor announcements. So raise your hand if you have some an announcement. We have Ree, then Paul, then Gabe. I'm excited to share on one of our goals about uh, supporting graduate students. Um, I received an email out of the blue, actually, so it was very lucky from our new um, graduate studies. She's associate vice, Pre vice president for graduate studies, Dr. Weffes, and um, I'm going to be meeting with her March 6th because they want to communicate graduate students' needs and pains and um, and understand them from us and and get that information to us. So it's nice to have, you know, someone in a leadership position with the university specifically dedicated to this, who we can talk to for TSAC and on behalf of our students. So that'll be March 6th, I'll be meeting. Whoever had given her my name, whether it was Dr. Barone, maybe, <laughs> I feel very blessed and um, looking forward to pursuing this. That's it. Awesome, thank you. Oh, um, going to Paul, then Gabe. Okay, then we'll go to Gabe. Okay, hello everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, I have two things. So, with the housing event, the resolution that I passed last week, we're getting that sorted out. There were just like some miscommunication issues, um, and so we're getting those fixed uh, today. Um, and then the second one is with, with the student fee review panel. Okay. So as y'all know, we had like the student fee review panel, which James and I sat on. Um, and so from that panel, I just wanted to bring up like how it works. And I think that's only like student input could really help change the way that it works. Um, because right now, so basically it's like a student fee, student something, you know, it's going to be changed. It goes to, to the budget people. Then, then they, ha they have a certain amount of time to like to form a committee of students. Now, picking these students, it's, uh, I believe it's two, two people from the student government, one graduate studies person, I think another undergraduate person, and I think one more person, but I'm not quite sure. But so basically, you know, they had to gather all of that and then um, to get student feedback from these, from any proposed changes, they only put out a blurb in the runner um, for a week and then that's like it. There's like no other communication on how to get feedback on any like um, like uh, changes within student fees and all that stuff. And so I think that's like something I'm trying to bring up to y'all to really think about as well. It's just that process of how student fees get input. Um, and with with like in, in addition to that, like on the panel that we had, we had uh, it was like a fee thing about um, the, the the hospitality and more specifically like the restaurant. Um, concentration and all that. And so the people on that fee board, none of us were affected by this fee. And so to get information, like the, the hospitality people did their own like research, but that was extra. That's like not a requirement. They're not like supposed to, they just did it as extra for fun. Like here's you go. Um, and so I just think, you know, it's really concerning um, the process of student fee review panels because um, of the lack of engagement of students and students who are who are actually affected by these fees so yeah cool 
Mike, do you have a direct comment about Gabe's? I do, yes. And maybe this is a question that maybe Dr. Barone can bring some more information to, but why is it that that's how our student fees are conducted? Why is it? Because, I mean, student fees are kind of very integral to our tuition and all stuff. We have to pay a lot of student fees. And when there is a fee on the board, this is the way we're communicating it to students, getting feedback on it? Like, uh, just a small blurb in the runner? I don't... I don't know what the runners' numbers are, but I know they're not great. I mean, like the probably <laughs> probably label probably maybe it's probably does a little better. Um, so I don't know. I maybe Dr. Brown can help a little bit on that, but um, yeah, I, I think it's very concerning. Uh, uh, James, do you want to respond? And then I can respond. Uh. So the only thing that I'll also point out too about the whole situation is when Gabe and I were brought on, the fee was pretty much approved. They realistically just wanted us to approve the language that was being used to be put in the runner. And at the same time, they want us to vote to approve it or approve the language based off little to no survey data on how this how the students feel. And so they're like, well, you guys are the representatives. And I think me and Gabe said multiple times, like we can't represent students that don't know about this, especially if it's only like a hundred not even 100, what was it, like 25 students out of 250? So, yeah. I'm um, responding. Dr. responding. Yes. Yeah, I'm just responding to Mike's question. I um, have only been involved in helping to recruit students for the process. It's my understanding that that process is outlined by our chief financial George Middlemist, whoever replaced George Middlemist, um, that area um, is who oversees that process, I'm pretty sure. Um, and so I'm not sure how it came to be, but that's where I would start is through the chief financial officer or what was the just title? AVP for administration and finance, I think. AVP for administration and finance. But we have a new person there, but that might be a great time to ask those questions to see how we determine that process and the structure and um, how student engagement looks. But that's been a process that's been, um, as far as I know, for a long time, that's the process that's been. I don't know how much revision there's been. So it's a good question to ask. Uh, back to you, Gabe. Awesome. And then I'll just add on to that. Um, is So like basically from when I brought up my concerns, I was like, well, this is kind of not OK that y'all are doing this. Um, Basically, it was like, okay, but these are kind of like the rules that there are set in place right now. The rules can change, but to change the rules, there has to be like initiative to change the rules and then like another another review panel to change to see if the changes can be made. And if the changes are voted on, then yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, Gabe. On to Paul. Yeah, I want to echo the thank you, Gabe, and um and unite with the frustration that you and Mike are both exhibiting at this notion of like makes us feel like a rub makes me feel like we're a rubber stamp on like on a, a, a student fee assessment that you know we have like a where they feign student input kind of is what I'm hearing I don't know I want to be more involved in the process so that might just come off a little strong but I will say that um, a quick update on some of the like a few announcements I've had uh, John reach out to me with some more information regarding the bike that he was interested in I have that information here and so um, I wanted to share that with anybody that um, is interested. Um, and uh, with that, I also have a letter uh, from Dr. Ben Cooper uh, from the Hopes Program, really speaking to the, the, the testifying to the fact that John's a student leader and a valuable member of our community. So I, I'm happy to share that with everybody and get it uploaded. I also wanted to mention that I've been in talks with my intep of the Black Student Alliance. Um, very grateful that we that, that the office space is available to them. Um, and so. Um, we, we've also begun um, talking about a potential partnership between the Student Advocacy Council and the Black Student Alliance and the bookstore, kind of like what we're talking about with the bookstore vouchers uh, or gift cards. We want to start a voucher program, maybe, to help kind of ease the economic burden of, of uh, picking up textbooks. We know that, um, you know, if you don't get your textbook in time for class and you fail that class, you're not likely to stick around here at MSU. And we think that the... Um, some of the things impacting our, our retention rate and our graduation rates are very much basic economic factors. And so this is one minor way we can we can uh, chip away at that and make our advocacy felt um, amongst the students and really support the students. And so get in on the ground floor. 
I'm still in talks with uh, the bookstore. I'd love to be in talks with any of you on developing and making this program better um, and seeing it happen, you know, because this would be this could be the next big thing we do. And it could be a really good good mark for our student government. Um, you know, beyond that, I also wanted to uh, raise again. I know a couple weeks ago I sent in the, um, the re it was a resolution, but we didn't send it in in time, so we didn't consider it. Uh, but essentially, it was in a resolution to mobilize students in defense of the Indigenous Child Welfare or the Indian Child Welfare Act, as it's called. But it's to it's to mobilize against uh, some attacks in the Supreme Court taking place against the ICWA program, um, a program that's that's fundamental for ensuring, uh, you know, sovereignty and national determination for Indigenous peoples in our country. Um, and I just wanted to raise that again. Uh, I'll be bringing it to the table next week, and I invite any of you to um, help me with that. It could be a really good place to act on a, a, a prescient issue. So I'll cut my debate, my my uh, stuff short with that. Thank you, Paul. That sounds very interesting. I'd love to work on that. Mike, did you have something? OK, wonderful. Um, anyone else? On to the advisor updates. Hi again. Um, so I just wanted to let you all know that um, I as far as I know, stipends were processed this week. For those of you who are paid through HR, your stipends might have been processed early um, or through payroll if you're currently employed um, with the institution. And so I think there are three of you in that situation. And so um, I would, I, th I sent an email yesterday on our day off, sorry, um, <laughs> asking you all to please let me know if you received your stipend last week. And then for those who are um, not through that, uh, who are not current employees of the institution, your stipends are ran through accounting. And uh, hopefully you got an email from Workday or someone um, in accounting today indicating that those are in process. If you have not received your stipend or any notice, can you please let me know by Monday, wait over the weekend, see what happens, um, and let me know if it has not come through. Um, but I was ensured it should happen today or tomorrow. And then the other piece to that is please check the amount of your stipend <laughs> in addition to making sure that it's there and making sure that the amounts are correct um, or that there aren't duplicate stipends. <laughs> um, because if that happens, that's a different problem that we will need to um, resolve. So um, if any of those scenarios happen that are problematic, please let me know. Um, and we will work to continue to get them fixed, but hopefully things are great and that has not happened. Um, the other thing I wanted to let you all know, I, I said that we would be having lunch or some kind of community building activity. I put it on the calendar again um, this week for March 17th, hoping that we can um, do that. So just thank you to everyone who's accepted that invitation and more to come, more details on that. I know that's the Board of Trustees meeting, Gabe. I saw that. <laughs> I know that, but um, so I know Gabe might be not able to join us or a little late, but still wanted to make the time and hold your calendar. So thank you for that. And then um, Armando's in California right now, so that's why he's not here. He's at a conference with Fraternity and Sorority Life, but um, he said that he's working um, on elections and a lot of the elections materials and getting those things out thanks to Chad and um, others who are helping to support that. So things look good and like we can stick to our timeline, which I'm really happy about because um, I thought it was ambitious, but I think we're we're gonna be okay. So thank you to, to everyone um, for helping to recruit potential members for next year. I think that's it, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barone. On to elections manager update with Chad C. Um, so for the most part, just echoing what has already been said by uh, Chad and Dr. Barone. Um, I suppose on the back end, uh, candidate applications have been finalized. Um, so those ones, uh, if you're interested, I can print you out a uh, paper copy, but we're gonna have electronic copies ready to go on March 10th. Um, and that's going to be the first official day that uh, Canada applications will start uh, being accepted. Um, <clears throat> and then additionally, election codes, the rough draft has been finished. So um, I think I sent that all out to you guys to take a look at and um, hopefully get that uh, finalized here soon. Um, 
And then uh, just doing general uh, planning for events uh, coming up. So if anyone from TSAC wants to help out in um, supporting those events, reach out. Um, Because we're planning on having at least four primary events uh, coming up. uh, Not to mention just kind of tabling as it goes as well. Uh, I believe that's it. I may. Um, Our first event that we're doing in the name of elections is... Let me find this. It's in February. Do you have the date, Chad? Not off the top of my head, but it's going to be an ice cream social. And isn't it February 27th? Or, no, it's March. Sorry. March 7th? March 7th. Hold fast, please. Hmm. Um. It's going to be on uh, March 14th. Mm-hmm. March 14th. Awesome. Yeah, so March 14th, that's, uh, it's going to be us seeking candidates as well as this would be an event that would be um, good for us to share any survey material that uh, Paul, Naomi, and Dan are working on um, as well as just community building uh, in general. Yeah. And Alex, sorry. So two questions I have for that. Um, do you mind throwing these on our calendar, sending us some calendar invites for these events? Just Make sure they're on there. Sure. Perfect. And then secondly, so this 14th event is just seeking candidates. Do you want, because 10th is when you're allowed to announce, do you want potential candidates to go to that event as well, or is that different? Uh, let me clarify. Uh, so the 29th is when you're officially allowed to announce. The 10th mm-hmm. is only when we're accepting applications. Um, so you can't, uh, so mm-hmm. I would say yes, you are definitely invited. I see. So is that so when's voting again? Is that after spring break or before spring? OK. Um, yeah, I believe the 29th is the day after we get back from spring break. Will there be ice cream for dietary restrictions? Yes. Thank you. Are there any more updates that you have, Chad? Uh, I believe uh, you and Dr. Brown covered them. Lovely. Um, we are about three minutes early to our public comment time. Um, so if you are a member of the public that would like to make a comment or uh, in person or online, please make yourself known. Mr. Blair. Hello, student government. Thank you for having me. Um, I'd just like to express a brief um, discontent with the use of space in the Tivoli right now. Um, I understand that AHEC has taken some space to use as offices. The Tivoli has to be one of the most heavily trafficked space by students, um, and it should be a place for students. Um, one of the challenges I have faced as a leader of a student organization mm-hmm. is uh, its community and visibility. AHEC using that using those spaces as office spaces exacerbates these issues uh, and works against the goals of the student body. Thank you. Thank you for that, Blair. Um, If there are any other members of the public, um, Athena. I'm sorry, I I wanted to second that. I didn't realize that my mic was already I'm done. Uh, I totally agree with Mr. Blair there. Um, my apologies for assuming your pronouns, but um, yeah, sounds like a good concern to bring up. Thank you for that. If there are any other members of the public, make yourself known. Otherwise, we will move to a five minute break. All right, five minute break it is. Uh, we will return at 3.05.
You got me doing pretty smart, but you got me right down to the heart. All right, everybody, welcome back. Just to reiterate this. Just to reiterate this time from 3 to 315 is available for public comment. So if there are any other individuals who would still like to make comment, we will halt any business that we are going over to uh, create space for you. Great on to um, as there is nothing with old business, we're going to be moving to new business and we have the AHEC parking information request from Paul. And the other thing that he talked about today too. Sure, yeah, no problem. Um, I would actually I've sent them both in the chat. 
And just reading the names really kind of tells you what they're about. And so I don't want to waste too much time on this necessarily. And if someone feels like they want to talk about it, I don't want to discourage discussion. So that's, but um, basically the first one is an AHEC parking information request that asks questions like, you know, where, like what kind of revenue are we seeing from which lots? Mike's been nice enough to send me a budget um, that answers some of those questions, but there are more. Oh, thank you, Candy, for pulling that up. Um, so the second question kind of talks about, uh, yeah, I won't read the whole thing, but um, it's really to help us understand comprehensively parking and the history of parking prices, um, the cost of maintenance and stuff like that, so that um, we can have data to guide our advocacy on this particular issue that students have been talking to us about. And I know it was an issue that we united on when we all entered into this council. And so this is just so we have the information necessary to do a good job moving forwards. Um, and uh, depending on how, how, how long it takes to get this information, um, this could be information we use next year. I'd love to um, engage in this advocacy as soon as possible, but I understand we're asking for a lot with this info. Um, this is for the parking one. Now the second one is, Pardon my disorganization. Ah, so the second one is an information request regarding black student enrollment, retention, and support. And this one's aimed at the university administration. Uh, we, wanna, we want them to answer questions, um, basically an overview of current initiatives and programs aimed at supporting black students, including scholarships, mentorship programs, and cultural events, information on what they're doing to attract and retain black students, um, more data on enrollment, retention, academic performance, and any trends or disparities compared to other student groups, feedback from black students and other stakeholders on the effectiveness of current initiatives and programs. And so there's more writing and text that contextualizes this, and I'll just save that. I would motion that we continue the meeting. Um, but yeah, these are just two information requests signed to end to send. Thank you, Chair. Gabe. Awesome. Hi, Paul. OK, so a question I have for you. Are you sending this on like your behalf or on the behalf of the council? I would be sending this as a member of the council. And so it's not like I'm saying this is uh, this is information to be used for the student government. And so a little bit of a mix between those two, I'd say. OK, then I don't know if James knows this or who would know this. Would this have to then be voted on if it's sent as a member of the council? Because it doesn't like the handbook say if it's like from the student government. Then we have to be like, if anything about a student government thing, then we have to vote on there some. So, just in response to that, I am moving on the information provided by Taylor last a uh, couple weeks ago, which was information requests like the one I'd provided earlier on sustainability could just be sent out and don't necessarily need to be voted on. Now, that's not the case. I mean, we could talk about that, but I also think that, you know, there's no harm in having more information at the end of the day. Um, and so, good things to send out. Yeah, I agree with Paul. I think as a member of the council, we are all entitled to ask for information that helps us help the students. So I don't really see it as an issue as saying, hi, I'm a council member of the student government. I'm asking for this information because I think that's kind of part of our job. That's, yeah, OK. Um, so I don't think we need to vote on this. Is, are you, is that all good, Paul? Oh, Alex, yes. Um, so I'm in an honors course, uh, Dynamics of Change, and there's a group project they're working on that's specifically focusing on the AHEC parking. Um, would you be willing to share that information with them for their project? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Um, thus concludes those two things. On to the amendment proposal with James, and thank you so much, Paul. OK, uh, I sent a um, proposal into our chat. Um, it's a relatively simple amendment. So basically what the student is currently in our constitution, we outlined that in order to submit a agenda request, it needs to be put in within 48 hours. I understand that that time gap is a little maybe too harsh, so I'm actually asking to reduce it down to 26 hours. The reason I do 26 hours is because I understand that at the 24 hour mark, our executive assistant or our chair needs to submit the agenda to the public. Um, so that's just making sure that, that 1230 or whatever 26 hours from the agenda and the next council is um, the agenda is set and complete and that way people aren't adding stuff past it and making our chair and executive assistance lives more difficult. I do outline that uh, bills 
So resolutions or amendments cannot be submitted past the 26 hour deadline. Uh, but if it's something that is not involving a bill or amendment, they can easily just be added because it's something super small and super simple. Um, if there is a emergency such as funds or support from students or a bill concerning accountability, then we can make a an exception to have that added to the agenda and even pass the 24 hour deadline to introduce your amendment. Um, and so the only other thing is that I would ask that the chairs and or executive assistant start just letting everyone know when the um, agenda request book has closed. So that way everyone knows like, all right, it's closed. I can't add anything. Okay, let's open the floor for debate. Who has thoughts? Paul, go ahead. When I'm considering what I bring to the table this week, I talk to students during the week and I ask them like, like what's going on in your, like what, what obstacles do you have in your education right now? Um, and I leave my business card with them when I can. I ran out of business cards already. Um, and it kind of guides what I bring to the table. I'm curious what students asked for this and how this can help us better serve students. Um, all I'll say is it's already in the Constitution and I'm minimizing it from 48 to 26. Um, and as I said multiple times that the agenda request is pretty much open 24 seven besides when it needs to close on Thursday uh, midday. And so this is just to ensure that we are you know, making sure we are on a timely management and that we're making lives for the chairs and the executive assistant a little easier rather than just throwing in random things an hour before they're about to submit the agenda or even right when they're about to submit the agenda. And as I said multiple times, if it's a resolution or a bill that is requested by a student, that's completely fine. But if it's just like your own resolution that you didn't throw onto the agenda request when it's been open for a week, you know, you had that time. It takes 30 seconds to type in. I want to. Submit this. Thank you, Mike, thank you. So um, I do like a little bit. This does um, free up some ambiguity that are otherwise found in our Constitution. It does make it a little more clear and it does make it a little bit more um, easier to kind of support the students more immediately than kind of have them wait like through some bureaucracy. So I do support that as well as the accountability portion of it. Um, so just really just a point of clarification here. Basically, this is what the saying is you can motion to amend the agenda to add like say a budget request from a student org organization to look at or something like that. Yeah, you can still very much easily make like a request to add something to the agenda. It just can't be a bill or a resolution. Anything that would basically take up more time on the agenda because um, like I said those type of things you should probably be working on in advancement and I understand that sometimes students do request stuff at last minute and that's why I allow emergency resolution slash amendments. Thanks Gabe then Paul. Awesome hello hello okay um, my question cool resolution awesome I just want to ask like Kenny and the chairs is like that two hour mark OK with y'all? Like, is that good within like capacity wise of like um, getting those requests, putting them in the agenda and organizing that? Just want to make sure that that's like good on y'all. Because y'all are the ones taking this on. Defer to Kenny. Yes, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> yes, two hours would be enough. Um, 26 hours beforehand would mean that the agenda request closes on 1230 PM on Thursday. Yeah. OK, cool. If I can comment to that as well, this works right now, but there's no guarantee that next next council next semester we have an executive assistant who has the two hour time block prior to the 24 hour minimum requirements to continuously update the agenda. So I would keep that in mind as well. Cool. Um, on to Paul. I would just like to circle back to the two questions I asked at the beginning of discussion and recognize that they have not been answered. Um, that's all. James. Um, I believe in having a good structure for our government to make sure we are doing things on time in an organized way. And so, like I said, we already have this rule. I'm simply 
minimizing it from 48 to 26. I don't understand the confusion of making life easier and less complicated for currently Kenny, our executive assistant, or future executive assistant slash chairs. Okay, anyone else have anything they want to add in this discussion? Motion to raise the question or call to call, call the question. Sorry, that sounds great. Is there a second? I'll second that. Wonderful. Um, Chad, can you do the call for the voting? Most certainly. All right, we're going to go Alex. Aye. Mike. Aye. Ree. Aye. Paul. Nay. Chad, aye. Taylor, no. Uh, James? Aye. Gabe? Aye. Uh, Dan? No. All right. Yeah, go ahead. The motion is successful. Congratulations. Um, on to the next order of business, which is the resolution to support MSU Denver faculty and staff. Mike. Thank you. Uh, Kenji, you might throw that on the screen. Thank you. So um, before I start this resolution, um, I'd just like to thank a few people. I'd like to thank um, Barbara and um, Professor Weiss of the Faculty Senate. They, their input has been invaluable in kind of determining these resolution. And thank you, of course, Reed to our faculty um, Senate advisor over there. Um, you do an amazing job, so I appreciate it. So once this gets put up, I will read this. Um, and just some pretext, this is in response to the kind of the drama of the three by three workload. You might notice we don't have a provost at the moment. We have an interim provost now, so this will kind of address some of that. So, all right. <clears throat> So this is a resolution to support the Faculty Senate, written by me and Mike Warner, which is collaborated on by Ree Barco, and then endorsed by Paul Nelson Jr. So we will start off. Whereas the staff and faculty at MSU Denver have been working, working tirelessly to implement a three by three work plan for the university, which has been in development for several years. Whereas the Board of Trustees of MSU Denver has indefinitely paused the implementation of the work plan, causing frustration and disappointment among our staff and faculty. Whereas the staff and faculty of MSU Denver are experiencing burnout and financial constraints, making it difficult for them to continue providing a high quality education and services that MSU Denver is known for. Whereas the MSU Denver student government recognizes the invaluable contribution contributions of the university staff and faculty to the success of the institution and the well being of its students. Therefore, be it resolved that the MSU Denver student government stands in solidarity with the staff and faculty of MSU Denver and fully supports their efforts to implement a three by three work plan. Be it further resolved that the MSU Denver student government calls on the board of trustees to reconsider its decision to pause indefinitely or to indefinitely pause the work plan to work collaboratively with the staff, faculty and find a path forward in it. <clears throat> find a path forward that is in the plural interests of MSU Denver and the students who attend. Be it further resolved, the MSU Denver student government will work to amplify the staff and faculty's voices and advocate for their needs and concerns, including addressing burnouts and financial constraints adopted by, well, if it passes, it'd be adopted today. So yeah, that's the resolution. Um, let me just kind of make a general comment here. I think um, we student government should absolutely support our staff uh, and faculty here at MSU Denver. Um, they're the reason we're here. They're the reason we attend the university. And I mean, I think we have probably the best faculty and staff in the state that attend here at MSU Denver. So um, I would ask for y'all to support this resolution. Thank you. Alex, then me, then Gabe. Uh, just a then point Paul. of clarification, Mike, the, the three by three is where the teachers will take on the three classes. Yes, so the three by three work plan would mean that each um, professor would take on three classes instead of four. Currently, they're taking four by four kind of classes, so this would kind of free up some time for research and kind of give more time to the classes that they're teaching. Got it. Thank right. you. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'll, I'll just go. <laughs> go into Taylor. Thanks. Um, Mike, did you see my little comment? I mean, I can see it now. OK, I'll read it. Um, so it says, the Board of Trustees, MSU Denver, but I also think I th some of this responsibility falls on our president of MSU Denver. So I am suggesting a an amendment to that to add along with the president of MSU Denver. 
Yes, I think I agree 100%. Um, we can add in there. Do you want to say like President Davidson or call her by name or like just by president? Again? I what think, do you think just by president. Perfect. I agree with that 100%. Excellent. We'll go to Gabe. Awesome. I think the solution's great. I love it. It's good. Um, let's see what I was going to say. I was going to say something that I forgot. But anywho, after this is like voted on and stuff, and if it passes, I can send it out to the board um, today. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, do you have a direct response? Yes. So if this passes, then I'd like to see it sent to the board trustees as well, as well as the president's office. And then furthermore, I'd like to take this to the faculty senate on March 1st when we go. So. Can I respond? <laughs> Please. Please. <laughs> if this passes and it is sent to whoever it's sent to, not just for this, but all resolutions. Can you all please make sure Armando and I are copied as well as um, Dr. Simpkins and Taylor? Oh. Certainly. And not you, yeah, you mean Dean, Our, Dean Tackett. Dean, Dean Tackett, Excellent. Taylor Tackett, not Taylor Luke. <laughs> All right, um, we're going to go to Paul and then Taylor again. Thank you, Chad. Um, and thank you, Mike, for writing this wonderful resolution. I couldn't have written it better myself. I stand by every line of it. And one of the reasons why I support faculty here at MSU Denver and the call for the three by three is because I understand that COVID-19 and the, the, the development of education here on our campus has shifted drastically from what educators were, were doing in 2019, right? We have hybrid classes now. Um, we have, you know, just total online classes. I mean, they were there before, but now more than ever, they're here. And so the landscape has shifted dramatically. And the question is, has the way we supported faculty shifted adequately? I think not, right? And I think that the data-driven proposal that's been worked on for some time by faculty in the faculty senate, like I had a teacher uh, talking uh, talking to me about this last semester um, about how much work they were all putting into this. And that was it seemed to just have been brushed aside. And so, in the spirit of sh in the spirit of true shared governance and supporting our faculty, the main drivers of tuition and funding for our university, I think it's critical we pass this show all the support we can to our faculty and you know once we do pass this let's let's assess its effectiveness and if it's not effective let's hit the ground again and redetermine how we can best support the faculty in this time thank you um, and i urge other council members to support this amendment uh, or support this resolution and then distribute it as best we can once it's done thank you and we'll go to taylor again thanks mike and chad and everyone um I just I really love this resolution and I especially think since we're talking about the Board of Trustees, it would be very fitting to know how our student trustee feels on all of this. Um, since our student trustee is there for all of the Board of Trustee meetings and probably knows what's going down the best out of any of us in here. <laughs> OK, <laughs> um, so. With this whole situation, um, I didn't know about any of this. And from what I've like talked with other trustees and stuff, it was kind of just like a little confusing because we didn't know that this was going to be coming up. Because um, like during our retreat, during all that, we didn't hear about it. We'd heard that, that like things were in the works, but we didn't know what was in the works. Um, and so it was just like a little, little confusing. Um, and I think there's just like a lot of like um, information on a lot of the like unknown information um, because the like, information provided during our board of trustees meeting where this was brought up was a lot, a lot more like a correlational data instead of causation data. And so the board was looking more for like causation data instead of um, correlational. Um, but I feel like in this situation, it's kind of hard to pinpoint those data points because there are other, there's a lot of like other factors that go into it. I am like in full support of this uh, because because of the, of the way that the three by three plan was described, not only does it help uh, faculty who are uh, on really high workloads, you know, being burnt out and having to still deal with like uh, research and service, which are parts of their um, workload as well, in including teaching. Um, and so after like hearing um, the, the ex-provost Tatum's uh, 
um, presentation on it and stuff, it was really cool to see how, how the 3 by 3 plan not only frees up space for more research and more service, but also more time and mentorship with students. Um, and so to be able to really talk with our with our professors who are in the lines of work that we want to be in and really be and for them to have time to really engage with us and interact with us. And so I I think this is great. I'm like, I'm all for more. The more help the students can get, the better for the university, I feel, because if we support our students, then we're supporting our university. Yeah. And then. Did you have an additional comment or did you no? Lovely. Call the question. Or motion to call the question. There's a second. second. Alex seconded. All right. We will uh, call the question. Um Alex. Hi. Mike? Yes. Bree? Yes. Paul. Yes. Chad, yes. Taylor? Taylor, I. Uh, James? Aye. Gabe? Yes. Dan? Yes. Wonderful. That is a unanimous decision of all those present. Wonderful work, everyone. On to the student allocation request. Blair, Whithead, Pi Sigma, Epsilon. You may stand. <laughs> I, I yeah, we do request that you use a microphone though. Wonderful. Doing that, I'll begin. Um, hello, student government. I believe I've had the privilege of meeting all of you individually. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with me, my name is Blair. I'm a first year student here at MSU, uh, and it's my honor to represent Pi Sigma Epsilon today as their VP of Finance. I joined Pi Sigma Epsilon because I wanted more out of college. And I joined, I came to college because I wanted more out of life. And it's my great privilege and joy uh, to have gotten just that. And it's my excitement to have the opportunity to share that with more students. <laughs> I'm here today to ask for your help sending 14 students to Norfolk, Virginia to participate in a national convention. But before we get there, let me back up a bit. What is Pi Sigma Epsilon? At MSU, Pi Sigma Epsilon is uh, a student organization open to all majors. Um, we focus on developing the sales and marketing skills of our members. Nationally, Pi Sigma Epsilon is a co-ed fraternity focused on developing sales and marketing skills with a few other things thrown in there. Uh, networking, public speaking, uh, and the like. Now, we hold regular competitions to practice these skills and give students the opportunity uh, to hone their craft. The biggest of which is the national convention held once a year. Now, what is the national convention? Next slide, please. Nationals is an intercollegiate event that prepares students for success in business and in their careers by giving them an out of the classroom experience, an out of the classroom opportunity to practice what they've been learning in the classroom. Secondly, it's also a safe environment to practice your skills. For example, uh, we had one member. This was her first sales call she'd ever done, a sales role play. She gets about halfway through her pitch and then runs out of the room crying. In the real world, you would lose money. In this world, we all we give is feedback. Um, it's a really, really great growth opportunity. Now, there's four main competitions uh, at this event. The biggest is the Pro-Am sales competition. This is a sales role play, uh, and essentially what you do is you represent a mock company, or excuse me, you represent a real company as a mock salesperson, um, and you sell a judge on a product. There are also public speaking events, the finalists of which will um, give their speech to a room full of like 300 people. 
which is terrifying, but some people are into that. So that's the opportunity for them. Um, there's also a marketing competition as well as an interview competition. Next slide, please. Skip, skip two slides. Thanks, Kenny. I have a couple specific goals in going to this competition. Um, namely, I love getting out of my comfort zone. That's where a lot of the great growth happens. Um, secondly, I can't wait to refine the things I've been learning in the classroom, out in the real world. Um, lastly, is to create those valuable memories that make college worthwhile. So who remembers their first day of their intro English class? Hey, wow, Paul must really like English. We want to create those memories that will last a lifetime. The memories that you'll build your career on, you'll build your identity on. Uh, and it's a really beautiful thing to watch. Next slide, please. It is also the perfect opportunity to gain diversity in thinking uh, in two big ways. Namely, there are going to be chapters from all across the nation at this event. From Utah to Hawaii uh, and everywhere in between. By interacting with these students, MSU Denver students stand to gain experience and perspective that otherwise would not be available to them. Secondly, they're going to compete in situations that represent real world problems and that challenge them to think in a different manner. That will challenge them to think differently. Next slide, please. Now, once they've gained this knowledge, dissemination of knowledge is a key pillar for us. Um, namely, we always do a debrief after these events. Um, you'll get up in front of the chapter, say what went well, what can you work on? and what surprised you. Secondly, those with experience train those without. Uh, and it's that's how we create sustainability in our chapter. And that's also how we create uh, longevity at this school. Next slide, please. Now, we are reimagining possible by providing this opportunity to the students to show them what they're really capable of. Again, the example I gave earlier where the girl ran crying out of the sales call. Um, she didn't even think she could do it in the first place. We coaxed her and we encouraged her and we got her to try something she didn't think she could do. She went on to place top five uh, in this very university's uh, sales competition, uh, Rocky Mountain Madness. The second thing. Uh, and it's also one of the more beautiful things that is open to all members. While this is a professional fraternity focusing on business, um, our president is actually from the School of Hospitality. Uh, we accept anybody who's willing to invest in themselves. Lastly, we're setting up our students for career success. There's over a dozen corporate partners with Pi Sigma Epsilon most of which are Fortune 500 companies. And I guarantee you that if you went to this event wanting to get a job, dedicated to getting a job, you would leave with a job or an internship or a phone number of, a, of an important person in your field. I mean, it's, it's both competition and job fair and, and you know, personal growth opportunity all wrapped, in, all wrapped up in one. It's really a beautiful thing. Next slide, please. Now, skills. There's a couple specific skills that I hope to gain uh, so that I can better the student populace here at MSU Denver. Um, namely, leadership. As a leader of this organization, honing my ability to concentrate our efforts on a common goal uh, has been hard. To be honest, it is a difficult thing. And I look forward to the chance to practice what I've learned thus far. Uh, and to learn things that I do not know yet. Um, also, practicing sales skills and the other stuff will be fun. Next slide, please. I'm here today to ask for your help to send 14 students to Norfolk, Virginia. What I have done already towards this aim is work with student travel. We've applied for funding um, that will cover the airfare out to Norfolk. We're also working with the Center for Professional Selling, um, who is somewhat symbiotic with our fraternity. 
uh, in covering uh, the remaining costs of registration, uh, food costs as well. I'm here to ask you all for the maximum amount of $3,000 to help cover lodging for these students. Next slide, please. Thank you for your time today. I look forward to working with you all. Before I leave, are there any questions? We should open the floor to discussion, yes? Yes, okay. Paul, then Mike, then me. If we can get more students to give presentations like this, oh my goodness, will the level of education at our university be, be, be raised, right? When I'm sitting in class and I get a presentation and it's like a bunch of text on a screen and I'm bored out of my mind and I'm reading it while they're reading the very same thing, like it is mind numbing. I was sold this notion, right? And so it's a testament to how effective these events must be that Blair is so like so capable of bringing this for us like that. Like honestly, like if we can get this out of the, the students we send to this event, it's an investment well made, right? Um, I, the story about the uh, the student who had uh, went to that event, made the call, cried, and through experiencing some real like struggle and like experiencing something new, became a top five participant in the in a challenge here in our state. Gosh, like we need to invest more in this, and this is an opportunity to do it. I think it's a fair amount that's being asked for, especially considering the fact that there are so many other funding sources involved. It sounds like. Um, they've done their due diligence in, you know, not coming to us necessarily first on this, but having pursued other accessible funding resources. I'm fully in support of uh, of sending as many students as we can to this, and I, I think this was really well presented. Thanks for coming here, Blair, and sharing your time with us. Go to Mike, then Taylor. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you, Blair. You, your leadership and your passion for this. Um, I, I sense it in droves. Um, that was an amazing presentation. Um, thank you for presenting it here today to this body. So uh, just a little update, little kind of update the members on how this process works, because this is the first student funding application that has been submitted to us this um, term. So um, as per our bylaws, um, any the maximum is 3000. That is the maximum request that any student organization can um, access from us. Um, to that um, it is a two thirds vote to approve of these measures or approve of these funds to be used. Um, and then lastly, um, as Blair is pre presenting today, um, as per bylaws, we will not vote on this till next week. So um, that's just uh, how the process will go. Um, I'll also mention I am a member of this um, organization, so I'll be abstaining from that vote. So thank you all. Thank you, Mike. Taylor. Thank you for the clarity on that, Mike. I wanted to, I was wondering, um, have, has, Blair, has your fraternity reached out to the business department for funding? The Center for Prof Professional Selling is a subset of the School of Business. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, we have partnered with them closely in sending students to these events. For example, in November, I went to New Jersey to compete in a similar competition. Um, I was able to do so solely due to the support of the Center for Professional Selling. Go to ball. I'll keep this part short, but something that, that came into my mind again. Um, it's a reiteration of what the, uh, the BRC was saying about the necessity of us focusing on increasing retention and enrollment at every level. Every student, every faculty, staff, administrator needs to think about what we can do in our positions to increase um, retention, graduation, and enrollment. And I think this is a step to that end. So in the week of consideration prior to us voting on that, think about that. Think about how much this could mean for um, improving our retention, enrollment, and graduation rates from that 10% figure we have at present. Um, this, this seems to me like a great way to um, infuse student leadership, uh, marketing, and um, good business acumen into our community here on campus in a way that could really jumpstart student orgs in a way that could really lift up that uh, those figures on an, on uh, enrollment retention and graduation. So think about that. All right, is there any more discussion from counselors? Alex, go ahead. 
Is there any like formal resolution or anything like that that we as a council would need to pass? And then also great presentation, Blair. Pass that to Mike. It looks like he has an answer. So yes. So um, as Blair has given the presentation, um, I will write up a formal um, resolution next. Or, well, resolution next week um, to be voted upon next week. So. Yes. I is that enough time for you, Blair? Yes, that is enough time. Um, the date of travel will be March 28th. So that should be enough time. Yes. One month from now. So we have a month. So if it happens before that month is over, we're good. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, permission granted. Permission to come aboard. <laughs> Thank you for that. Beautiful presentation, Blair. Uh, we will have our decision for you after next week's meeting. Um, we will move on to Chad C for an elections code conversation. Um, so as was expressed earlier, we uh, came out our uh, elections came out with its uh, rough draft of the code. Hopefully this code will be working and be able to be used uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, I don't know how many of you have taken a look at the rough draft, but uh, I'm hoping to uh, get this uh, sorted out and passed. The sooner the better. Uh, March 10th would be the deadline because we need these. Uh, we need the code solidified um, before uh, applications can start to be accepted. Um, so next week would maybe be preferable uh, for uh, passing or for deciding or for passing these if it's, one, if it's the way it's going to go. Uh, but just keep in mind, March 10th is going to be the deadline. Otherwise, it's going to affect other um, other uh, elections timeline issues. So um, any concerns that come up, uh, please bring them up uh, as soon as possible so that it can get rectified. Um, I guess to that end, uh, I will say I uh, since I've been working on this and looking at it with fresh eyes every day, I do have a few revisions to the document I have. I can share those with you if you prefer. Um, or I can just send a, a revised edition out to you later uh, today. But um, yeah, I guess at this point we'll hand it over to open. Okay, let's open the floor for discussion. Um, I think we should also hear those revisions. Um, then I know Mike has some comments and personally I have seven comments. Seven, not 70, just seven. Okay. Did you want to hear revisions first or did you want to go to discussion? Yes, can we hear those re revisions first and then discussion? Thank you. Um, all right, so first revision is uh, section one. Um, uh, one point one. Um, we'll, we'll do it like this. One point one five and a half. Because um, it's going to be inserted in and become the new one point one six. Uh, but uh, some definitions that I realized were lacking. This is going to be the definition for a general election um, and what that includes. Um, then secondly, um, 1.28. Um, the old method was to have a special election and uh, oh, sorry, 1.27. Um, was to have a special election or a temporary election in the event uh, that a election outside of the general was needed. Um, just for brevity's sake, uh, combining them into a single special election and having those rules uh, in place uh, would be uh, the change made there. Uh, lastly, right above section two um, would be the way of final certification for election services, a process called a risk limiting assessment. Uh, also known as an RLA. Uh, that's just where ballots are randomly sampled and tested to make sure they were accurately input. Uh, and that will serve as a final sign off for election services to say that they agree that the election um, results were correct. Uh, so that's another definition that would be needed to add. Uh, next is 2.01, um, just small language changes uh, going from officer to counselor. Uh, next is 2.12 and a half. 
Uh, this one is going to become the new 2.13, uh, so not under initiative, but under special elections. Um, uh, the, the change would be uh, something along the lines of language. Um, with the approval of uh, SGTSAC, a special election may be declared at any time or in lieu of a general election. Um, in effect, this is what happened last go around is a special election was declared um, just to make sure that it could happen. Uh, and the, the election couldn't fit within the timeline laid out by the general, so uh, certain changes had to be made. Um, so the next one is 2.2, uh, more language changes. Um, but next, in reference to uh, the previous uh, statement I brought up, uh, 2.21 and a half uh, would be an addition that uh, would say due to the uh, time limitations uh, of a special elections, election, election services would maintain the ability to alter codes uh, with the unanimous agreement of the election services team at its discretion. Um, next is 3.08 and one half. Uh, this would be a section on how to insert um, uh, ballots or referendums into the ballot. Uh, so, for example, I see this going of two ways, uh, and this, of course, would be for students to vote on. Uh, but that is outside of student fee purposes. Um, so I could see this going of two ways. One would be way of TSEC uh, referendum, uh, placing that item on the ballot. Uh, and then the second way um, would be by public endorsement which um, in, I mean, can be discussed further for the exact details, but my recommendation is a, uh, a uh, signatories of 40% uh, of the number to equal 40% of the previous voter turnout um, to be placed on the ballot. Essentially, the whole idea is if uh, TSAC uh, decides not to pass uh, some bill that's brought before them to be put on the ballot, but it's popular enough with the student body uh, that it's a way that the student body can still vote on it while circumventing uh, the uh, TSAC. Um, let's see. Lastly is uh, 7.11 and one half. Uh, This would be uh, this would implement uh, some language uh, along the lines of following final tabulation election services shall conduct a risk limiting assessment. And this uh, will also have a subsection just just briefly describes what the process is and the reason for it. Then 7.12 and one half uh, will say. Um, uh, oh, actually, sorry, this will just be seven. This will replace 7.12. Um, that the risk limiting assessment and the sign off by election services will serve as the uh, certification by unanimous vote um, to finalize the results. And that is all for revisions that I have. Thank you, Chad. On to Mike, then me. So, <clears throat> mine's a quick question, and maybe I just did not see this correctly. Is there a list of violations in this somewhere? Yes. Or, because that's not under uh, the violations, it's just a few things. I didn't. All right, let's stage. Yes. Um, section three, uh, page seven. Uh, starting on two point two two. We're getting there. We're getting there. Two point two two. Um, so yeah, that's the election procedures themselves, but then there's also violations uh, in consideration with um, like election services. So what are you like? What violations are you looking for specifically? So from my reading reading here, then there's like no specific. It just this this looks like it outlines violations. Just like what to do if there's a violation. What are oh. those violations? <laughs> uh, well, so it's kind of like. Uh, I guess, like, are you asking for, would you like a section specifically devoted to listing, like, potential violations out there? Yes, because um, 
in other SGAs, other um, elections codes, it lists the violations like you can't announce early, you can't do this, this, and this. Like I think underneath the violations, you should probably underneath this section, you should probably list it out in plain English. I gotcha. The rules so people don't go and breaking them. So that's my concern with that one. And I think Taylor has the rest of my things. Thank that we you. Can talk about. Okay, I have a f um, a few things. Can we go to one hundred and three? Okay, so I think that um, I don't think ballots should be limited to electronic because I think that can present an accessibility issue. So mm -hmm. I think it should be um, that they can generally be electronic, but paper ballots are made available upon request. Um, so speaking to that, it is a concern of logistics, and this is something that Armando and I have been in the process of talking about. Um, because this is done through Roadrunner Link, and that's what tracks it, they will have to have a Roadrunner Link account. So there is a method of, say, like provisional balloting that we could implement, uh, which would mean that we would essentially do. Check. There we go. Uh, we would have to come up with a process on the back end, which wouldn't be hard to do of taking a paper ballot of a signed signature of student and basically duplicating their options and putting it in for them. Okay. Yeah, I like uh, that. It, it is, but um, just the way the system is set up, we can't necessarily have like a direct paper ballot. Okay. But um, is... there is a method that I've been uh, thinking about and I, I would like that as well. Okay, as long as like those accessibility issues, they're like, it's made, it's clear. Um, then can we go to the special election section? I guess it's just more a comment about um, a certain scenario. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, if we are like filling a vacancy, I think that should be done through like the, the runner up, right? Mm -hmm. That's like my, what I think would be for the most time sense sensitive approach and the most cost effective approach. Those are, that's what I think about that. Um, so this, I would say, would be something more that you put into uh, the, the Constitution. Okay. Um, because you wouldn't need to declare a special election in order to choose the runner-up. You would mm -hmm. have the results still with you. Um, so in this instance, I would re I recommend that that would be part of your Constitution. Um, however, I could put something in here in the lines of how that runner up is selected. But the, the issue is, is that the um, election codes allow for the potentiality of ranked choice voting not to be used, mm -hmm. in which case the runner up would not be a viable option to select. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I would have to think about how to word that with uh, with it only. But I I guess I just recommend um, having that process be in the SGA constitution. Okay, I like that. Can we go to 302A? Okay. 302A. Okay. Um, I think it should say roles, not role, since someone could run for um, board of trustee, um, SACAB, and a council person. Agreed. OK, cool. Yes. Yes, that's exactly what I had. Um, now can we go to 309? OK. Um, wonderful. So it talked about alphabetical selection for like, does that mean like it would be alphabetical order by name on the ballot? Um, yeah, so the issue is uh, the way that Roadrunner link is set up. Uh, we attempted to do a randomization. Mm -hmm. but it's a solid randomization. Um, so I know alphabetical has um, its uh, biases mm -hmm. like implied. Um, unfortunately, Roadrunner Link doesn't allow for any way around that um, mm -hmm. because it's not just an alphabetical. It's more of a top down um, sort of biasy. And the issue is we can randomize the candidates, but that random order stays the same on every ballot. It's not actually randomized every time the ballots brought up. Oh, OK, so it there's it's just with the technology we have, there's no real way around it. That makes sense, but I, but like someone like Mike with a W last name, I don't think it would be cool like for him to be at the bottom of every ballot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. 
I mean, I guess the issue for that I'd see is like uh, either way, it's going to disenfranchise somebody. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a great way that I can see around that with the technology we're using. Um, unless we move completely to third party software. OK, I see. Um, Yes, we are paying for Rogue mm -hmm. Interlink, so I don't think we will do that. Yeah. Okay. Because I mean, like I hear what you're saying, if we put Mike up top, um, yeah. then that give that would give you know, for example, Mike uh, the advantage. advantage. But whoever now has A as a last name, mm -hmm. or whoever is randomly chosen to be up at the bottom, mm -hmm. is now disenfranchised. So maybe this is something we can talk about. In my opinion, alphabetical order just for organization's sake to make it easier to find the candidate you're looking for mm -hmm. because you are choosing multiple candidates. Um, outweighs the the cost of that bias. Well, it doesn't, but with what we have, it's a better option. I see. Just a thought. Yeah. Okay. No, I appreciate it. Now, can we go to five fifteen? Okay. Okay. Um, personally, I think five hundred dollars is a lot for a campaign. I think two hundred dollars would be more appropriate. Okay. Um. I don't have a dog in the race, uh, so I will leave that up to SGT Sachs discretion. OK. We can talk about it next week. We can make like a resolution. Yeah, I just I just uh, I just, you know, keep in mind that this does have a time limit on it. OK. Um, next, the event section. I don't know where that is, but I just want to I think there should be a little part where it says um, Candidates, they're not required to attend the events. Uh, that, oh, yeah. um, are you in reference to? Uh, is that in reference to five point two seven? Um, just that whole section. I'm not sure. I just know that you have a lot of cool events planned, but I don't want it to seem like um, if you're a candidate and you mm -hmm. can't go to one of the events, you're disqualified. Gotcha. Um, so there is language um, I need to look through. I can't bring up the exact number. Um, there is language in there that says candidates are required to attend all election services events. Uh, I could change that to be a little more um, specific uh, to say. Um, orientation. Like uh, the whole idea was orientation uh, was mandatory, but otherwise like that was going to be the only like election services events. Otherwise they would be election events. I mean, it's kind of like a trick of like semantics, but um, okay. that's that's why that wasn't touched, but I could make that more clear. Okay, cool. Um, and now I have a couple things that I think should be added. Um, so I think there should be a section for a student recall process of candidates, fees, and ballot measures. There should be a way for students to um, recall something if they don't like it, or a, or a council member if they don't like them. Oh, candidates or representatives? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, like for instance, when um, the referendum to make TSAC, if some students didn't like that, there should be a referendum to like vote on it again. Mm. Okay. Um, uh, I could do some research. The one way I see about going about it right now uh, would be looking up how um, Britain went about their recall election for the. Uh, I forget what it was called. Brexit. Mm. Uh, and just research about how their process of uh, collecting those uh, votes was going about. Okay. Um, would you agree or would you like something else? like do you think? Are you like, are you envisioning something else? Um, I think that sounds fine. I also think there should be a process like for students for like a specific uh, if they want to remove an elected official, they can do that, too. Um, yeah, I think I think that would uh, just that would all be kind of inclu included under the cool. same umbrella. Preferably, I I I would prefer it if the recall would initiate a special election mm -hmm. to discuss that. I like that too. Um, because I otherwise, uh, like I, it, it, I think it'd be too dangerous of creating factionalism within mm -hmm. student body of just removing without democratic vote per se. No, I like that. Whatever. You Whatever creative ideas mm -hmm. you have, I love it. But I just want these ideas to exist. Um, the one other thing I think is. Actually, no, that's it. We already talked about the vacancies being filled. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. We'll go to James. Uh, so I only have a piece in here about qualifications slash eligibility. Um, you mentioned that they cannot violate the TSAC student code of conduct. So I'm curious, does that include our governing documents and everything right now? Um, I think that was just a blanket statement of any TSAC governing documents uh, in general. I, I don't really know the distinction. If I need to add more clear language to do that, um, you can just, yeah, let me know. The only reason I bring it up is just because we have like just the quick, simple like eligibility that we set up in our constitution, which is, you know, obviously being able to be here for a full academic year, uh, not have violated MSU Denver student code of conduct, and that if you've been removed from the council before, you can't rerun mm -hmm. the things that we've outlined in our constitution. Gotcha. Um, yeah, that stuff uh, I can certainly add. Would you prefer it to be added? Well, yeah, I, there is a thing that says uh, all candidates will be subject to uh, TSEC's, uh, I believe it just said TSEC's constitution. Uh, the MS, the university code of conduct, state and federal laws. Uh, do you think that's sufficient? Yeah, I just want to make sure candidates know, like, if they're eligible. Mm -hmm. I knew that was one thing when I was running. Is yeah. like it was kind of like that same blanket statement where I was like, so am I eligible or am I not? So like, just trying to give them more clarification on. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can change up the the uh, the candidate application um, to perhaps reflect that more specifically. Thank you, James. We'll go to Mike. Hello. So um, this is in reference to one of Taylor's things. I agree with everything T Taylor said except one, and that is with um, show, um, the events. So we'd mentioned showing up to orientation being the only required event. Yeah. Um, I believe since we've done away with a lot of the requirements for this, meaning like GPA requirement, class size requirement, there's not a lot of requirements during SGA, but I think during elections, you, you should be required to attend some of these events, whether it's a debate, whether it's a town hall, um, I think it should be required to absolutely attend these events, get your name out there, know who you're, who you are, get to have the students know who you are. I think that's my light disagreement with Taylor. I think because um, right now in the mayor's race, you're required to go to two of the debates currently. The federal Denver mayor, they're required to go to the debates, and it's good getting it is, it's it is it's a requirement for those. Two. But um, I think it's good to get the names out there and get people exposed to these people. I think um, to respond to that, uh, I would say uh, while I agree in principle, um, just like legislatively thinking, uh, you know, have to think like down the road, like what could potentially happen. Um, and the risk would be, you know, due to COVID, due to other reasons, um, it, we would want to maintain the, the structure of the general election as much as possible. So to require events while preferable, uh, that could initiate scenarios where um, a large portion of candidates are disqualified just due to scheduling conflicts. We're going to go to Gabe, then back to Mike. Here we go. Okay, cool. And as a response to like what Mike said, I agree with Taylor. I think maybe looking at it, maybe as a percentage or something that they're like supposed to like attend eighty percent or something like that. I think I think that could be like a good way of just looking at it as a percentage. That's just like my opinion. But yeah. Mike. And yes, this is what I mean here is these don't have to be in person town. Hall. You have to go to every town hall. No, I think there should be some variety in these events, whether that's online forums. I mean, it should be very accessible to candidates as well, whether that's I mean, I could see a simple like posting a video kind of introducing yourself because right now, I mean, at least an issue I knew with this election, this past election is there was 20 people on that ballot and people who were voting for specific people had no clue. I mean, no clue who even you, you're supposed to rank all of them. They had no clue who these people were. I mean, they had a bio there, but then I mean, there were pictures there. I mean, it's kind of rough. I mean, it, you could probably attest to this. A lot of people just did not vote. Like they voted for the top three and then the rest of them, they just didn't rank. So I do think that is an issue and this would solve a little bit of that issue as well. Go to Ree. Um, I just like to say, keep in mind that the person that it hurts for not attending is the candidate. So to penalize them further could seem a little harsh. Taylor. Yeah, I don't think that it should be a requirement for um, candidates to go to events just because that can put some candidates at an advantage. Um, I also just think that. Um, hmm.
I just don't really, I think that there can be other accommodations made, like what Mike said, like a video, that sounds great. Um, but if a candidate doesn't go to any events and they still win, that's the will of the students. And I don't really, that's, it's democratic. Um, and I also know that sometimes mm, town halls can be sort of undemocratic undem in some ways, in that only some students have the capacity and ability to be able to attend them. Awesome. I'm next in stack, so um, I, I do want to echo what Taylor and everybody is saying. I think that it does only harm the uh, the student uh, or the candidate themselves, and it's up to them if they want to uh, promote themselves or not. It's up to them. Um, and then I will go back to something that Taylor said um, as far as balloting 1.03. Um, I don't see an issue with only having electronic ballots, especially with the sheer number of computer labs um, on our campus, as well as like any uh, computers that are that are in our office um, could also be used um, for voting. So I, I'm just thinking of how we can alleviate the burden of elections on our two elections managers. Cool. Um, and then we'll go to Paul and then Alex and then Taylor. Thank you, Chair. I um, just a quick parliamentary point. I would encourage a reconsideration of the application of the rules around direct response. I understand Mike had a direct response to what Taylor said earlier, as did I. Direct response isn't meant to be abused. It's meant to allow for conversation around a particular point to uh, to not become so disjointed as it, as it has. So if we have direct response, we can all talk about a particular point and move on to another point that was suggested. But at any rate, I just wanted to urge some reconsideration. Um, we definitely don't want to see it abused. So uh, I wanted to say that um, around this process of um, removing a candidate or um, reversing a decision um, using uh, using like a is it a petition of the of the students? Is that right? Like a recall of sorts. I would just I would want to make that process um, not difficult, right? It has to be something the students can exercise, but I also want to make it like something that can't be abused. Right by say 40 organized students or something. Um, the idea here is we can probably we walk that line. Um, I'd like to, you know, I guess looking at what they did in Britain might be a good idea about how if it's a proportional amount of the student body, um, that would be fair. But if it's anything less than like 300 students, I think it's something that could be really easily abused. So um, just some caution there. And then I wanted to suggest maybe a compromise on the notion of you know, mandatory attendance to these meetings. I, I think that, you know, Taylor raises some really valuable points, as does Ree, as does Mike, right? We want to, we want counselors who can attend events and who are committed to it. Um, so let's work in a human, like an understanding of the human element, right? And maybe the same way that we allow for a counselor to say, hey, I'm not feeling very well, I won't be able to make this meeting. We make that same allowance for these events. Um, and maybe we understand that, um, say uh, any candidates that, um, for example, have any disabilities that might put them at a disadvantage at this event that they too um, would, would, you know, we would understand or they'd be able to work with people. We're all human beings. And so we, we work in the human element. That's all I have to say on it. Alex. Um, I just wanted to echo uh, something that Taylor had said initially about the um, uh, electronic voting, I think I think it's great. Um, however, I I think it would be responsible for us to add um, uh, accessibility. So if there's, you know, um, maybe there's like a council member who's not running, or potentially like an elections chair uh, that can help a student if they are not familiar with the electronic system, help them kind of get there so they can vote. Maybe not. You know, and then like kind of stop at that point, but uh, just just something so that way we do have that accessibility uh, barrier met um, for for students who who aren't quite as like tech savvy, I guess. All right, um, 
Chad, closing uh, thoughts, comments? I guess just, um, yeah, I mean, my closing thoughts in relation to uh, the paper ballot, provisional ballot. Um, it's something I've wanted to do anyway, uh, and I don't think it should take too horribly long. Um, now, with the like accessibility portion of it, in my opinion, the electronic voting is just more accessible um, in general, but I hear what you're saying. Uh, and um, the election services email will hopefully be plastered all over all of our material um, and we'll be checking that regularly. So if anyone does have issues and needs to be addressed and needs support, um, I think uh, it should be attended enough. Um, and then secondly, uh, to the question of uh, mandatory events, um, I just want to reiterate that I, I feel the sentiment and while I like I agree with the sentiment entirely uh, that it would behoove candidates to show up to events, um, preferably all of them. I think just logistically speaking and with the goals of what elections is trying to do in general, it would not be uh, in our interest nor the students interest to disqualify potential candidates um, for legal reasons rather than democratic ones. All right, Paul has one last thought and then anybody else who has one final thought on this topic, please tell me now. Will the ballots be in more than one language? Uh, that would be up to if we can get translations. I would. Sorry, can I cut in? Cool. Um, I'd be interested in talking with you about that and, and maybe how we might be able to um, make that happen and I'm you know talking about if that's going like, to cost something if there's institutional allies we can work with to make this happen I, I just think it's important and it kind of popped in my head when you're talking about the paper ballot I was like oh dang you know the, I know the state of Colorado offers ballots in you know the youth language like and so not to say like we need to have it in 70 different languages necessarily but we should look at like the top five most spoken languages on this campus and consider having having them uh, having ballots available for those students and a lot of international students come here too, so. Yeah, um, yeah, so clarification on that. Uh, the process would be, we couldn't actually create a ballot uh, to be in a different language just because of the technology we're using. It would be too much, but in the same vein as a provisional ballot, we could have a paper one translated uh, to it. Um, that would probably be the way to go. All right, thank you, elections, Chad. That that concludes all of our new items of business. We will go to closing. Um, thank you all for, for your advocacy. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being you. Meeting adjourned. Woo. Thanks, everyone.